Ted Phillips is our guest tonight on Conundrums. Ted goes way back in the UFO field. He used to work with uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, and he has formed the Center for Physical Trace Research. This is where you investigate actual UFO landings, and you'd be surprised how many there are. Ted Phillips is next on Conundrums. Tonight on Conundrums, we're talking with Ted Phillips of the Center for Physical Trace Research. Ted, thank you for being on Conundrums. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, uh, let's just get right into it. Um, you started in ufology, ufology uh, back with Dr. J. Allen Hynek, right? Tell me about your beginnings in, in this field. Yeah. Actually, uh, I started having an interest in it uh, when I was nine. And uh, listening to uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, military reports that were being reported over the mutual uh, radio network. And uh, was pretty fascinated with it. And my dad uh, was at a uh, local radio station. And the newsman there, Bob Younger, had been a bomber pilot in World War II. And uh, knowing my interest, Dad said, well, let me introduce you to this guy. I think you'll like to talk to him. And Bob uh, was flying a night intruder bomber uh, over Europe and uh, uh, had an entire wing of these bombers. And all of a sudden, they see a circular bright object coming in from their right. And it flies very close, very near, uh, and over the bomber complement. And as it went over, uh, the planes were actually rocked by some kind of air, air disturbance. And uh, they watched, and after it cleared the, uh, the bombers, without hesitating, it reversed direction and flew back underneath, again, gyrating the bombers. And, uh, I mean, that really hooked me when I actually got to talk to this guy. And many, many years later, he uh, saw me on a, uh, an NBC news, television news show. And uh, he, over the, the uh, years, had pulled together all of the names of all the crew members, mm -hmm. plane numbers, every detail, and sent them to me. And that... I thought that was, you know, quite exceptional. How old and, were you when, uh, you when you first met this man? How old were you? I was, uh, let's see, I was 12. Ah, okay. Yeah. Then, in uh, 1964, we had the Socorro, New Mexico landing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went down and was looking into that. Well, J. Allen Hynek was there, mm -hmm. but we didn't know each other from anyone. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Four years later, um, I ran on to an exceptional case. It was a uh, physical trace case, multiple witness, daylight, uh, UFO on the ground taking off 300 feet from these guys. And they shot two photos of it, daylight, mm -hmm. uh, sharp images, best I've ever seen of a UFO. And uh, so anyway, this was an exceptional thing. 
And I thought, well, I'll just take a shot. And I called Northwestern University. And uh, Mary, uh, Alan's secretary, said, hang on. And surprised the devil out of me, he comes on. And we talked for about 15 minutes, and he said, can we talk to the witnesses and see the pictures? And I said, sure. So he flew down to Columbia, Missouri uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, after that, I gave him a number of cases that I'd investigated on my own. And uh, he takes them back to Chicago and about two weeks calls and invites me to come up for a couple of days. And I spent those two days uh, talking with he, Fred Beckman, and Bill Powers at Northwestern. And he asked me if I would like to join uh, his investigative group, which was known as the Invisible College. And uh, considering the fact working with Jay Allen and Jacques Vallée, I mean, come on, what are you going to say, right. you know? Now, did this, uh, did the things that you, the information that you fed to him, did they end up in Project Blue Book or was this after Blue Book? No, this was actually uh, during Blue Book. This was in 1968, and uh, they did not go into Blue Book. Alan kind of sat on them, and uh, because at that point he was convinced if he gave any of this stuff to Blue Book, it would just go down the rat hole to some other uh, agency that was quite apparent okay and uh, at what point did you start the Center for Physical Trace Research that was in 1998 mm -hmm. and uh, in 1968 uh, Alan and I were having dinner in St. Louis and he said you know we have so much stuff coming in we can't investigate it all and he said, we need to start specializing in particular types of events. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after he went through a litany of types of events, he said, would you be willing to go into uh, physical traces mm -hmm. from, from UFO landing cases? And I said, sure. And mm -hmm. uh, the really cool thing was uh, a year later at my first presentation, with Heineck and Valet and Andrus and the Lorenzans and in the front row, <clears throat> and I was a little nervous. And uh, I had 157 cases, mm -hmm. and everybody was blown away. That many landings with traces. Yes. And uh, the file now is just below 4,000 from 93 countries. 4,000 cases where UFOs have landed on the ground and disturbed the ground in some way? Yes, where the UFO is actually seen generating the trace. Is this worldwide or in the United States? Uh, 93 countries. Do you go to other countries and investigate landings? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not as much anymore because I'm pretty well tied down with the Marley Woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a uh, quite a big project for me now. Tell me about Marley Woods. This is something that you're currently investigating, right? Yes. Yeah. Twelve years ago, I had a call from one of the witnesses and uh, asking me if I would be willing to come down and help him out with some really odd stuff that was going on. And I almost turned it down because there were no physical trace cases. And he did mention to me, he said, we have taken some video. So I thought, okay, I can do a trip for that. And after I talked to these people, they were, you know, high quality witnesses. And uh, the gentleman's a banker and a rancher. And um, so as I uh, visited the area more and more, um, I actually, after five months, had the opportunity for the first time ever to see something I couldn't identify. Ah, okay. And uh, since that time, I've seen a lot, <laughs> and I'm I'm really amazed uh, well, to be able to say that. What did you see? Well, <clears throat> what I saw, uh, the owner and I of uh, the North Ranch uh, were standing out by an old windmill, uh, just sort of going over cases, and uh, all of a sudden he says, "There they are." 
And I look up, and it's it's twilight, but it's still very bright. Mm-hmm. And in the northeast, uh, there are three amber-colored uh, devices, and they're in a horizontal row. Uh, no sound, no wings, no motors, nothing, no means of support that you could see. And uh, parachutes, smoke, anything like that would have been quite visible. And uh, a fourth one comes on more to the east, and then a fifth one. <clears throat> the fifth one was actually quite close, about 800 feet away, and probably 600 feet above the ground. And uh, so I'm staying there just transfixed by this thing. And uh, they were so different from anything I would have expected. Uh, had it been a metallic disc with little guys crawling all over it, I would have been comfortable with it. But this was way, way different. And uh, the things looked to be about 12 feet vertically, about 8 feet horizontally. And the entire face was this odd amber color. And it was extremely bright, yet soft. Very difficult to explain the appearance. Yeah. And coming around the outside uh, edge from the top and down around the bottom and up the other side, uh, configuring a U shape, was a band of uh, the oddest purple blue color I've ever seen. And um, back 12 years ago, I was still looking for oil leaks or a piece that had fallen off of something or anything that you could pick up in your hand and was not at all big on aerial sightings. And uh, yet, contrary to everything I'd ever believed, my brain was telling me something might come out of or through these things. Right. And uh, nothing did, unfortunately. But uh, And uh, I've developed uh, that theory much more soundly now. Uh, but it was quite a thing. And the, the really trick thing was here I was uh, uh, a very uh, long time investigator, pretty well knew what to expect generally. And I was standing there for a minute and 37 seconds with the camcorder running, recording, aimed at the ground. Uh, and I didn't think for a split second until right at the end, and I got about one or two seconds. Of the fifth object, that's got to hurt. That's got to hurt. Oh, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, You said that they were devices. Did they? um, Did they rotate? Did they spin? Or how did they fly? Did they fly aerodynamically, or appear to just move in in position? Well, they actually they did not move at all. Not up or down, sideways. There was no visible motion at all, and that was really the bewildering thing to see these five things Mm -hmm. suspended in the air Mm -hmm. with plenty enough light to see anything that might have been hanging on or off of and uh, I mean it really kind of sets you back and uh, uh, the really odd thing and I've seen a number of these ambers since uh, sometimes in numbers of 15, 16 and uh, in all kinds of uh, configurations. But the fascinating thing is when they appear, it's like an old camera lens, a shutter opening. Mm -hmm. They go from nothing and they expand. And then when they disappear, they go back into that shutter closing down uh, configuration. And, um, I was lucky enough, once I got uh, CCD cameras set up, where you have good stable platforms Mm 24-7, I was standing one morning uh, at the same ranch just before sunup, and I was talking to Tom Ferrario, who's on the team, and I was facing east, and for some reason I shifted a little bit to the left, right behind his head in the sky, was this brilliant silvery object, circular, and uh, I yelled at Tom. By the time he turned around, it was gone. Mm-hmm. Well, I've seen a number of identical objects to this, but 
this was the first instance where I actually had video I could look at and look at over and over. Mm -hmm. And the really incredible thing is, and I, no matter how much I believe in physical stuff, uh, it appeared that this thing, it was a nice blue sky just, just before sunrise. Sun was about on the horizon. Um, uh, it appeared this thing came out of the sky itself. In other words, as so it came through a hole mm -hmm. in the sky. I know that sounds crazy. And uh, it was there for about uh, nine seconds. And it went back into that hole mm -hmm. or rift or whatever. Did it come and, out, fly uh, around, then go back into a hole? Or it no. just appeared and then disappeared? Yeah, it came out, and it did not move. It stayed in that same spot for nine seconds and then retreated back into nothingness. Mm -hmm. um, and this sort of stuff goes on at Marley. Uh, I have nearly a 1,000 cases reported over the last 12 years and 234 witnesses. And not one witness has ever talked to, uh, has ever gone public with any of their experiences. So, you know, it's not like you, uh, you make up a big lie and keep it to yourself. I mean, these people are very credible. Mm -hmm. And you, you said it's Marley Woods. So are you in a forest when this happens or are you in an open area? It's, uh, it's a very remote, heavily wooded area. Mm -hmm. A lot of, uh, bluffs and, uh, hollows and, uh, just exactly after all those years of, of investigating landings, it's exactly where I would expect there to be a concentration of, of activity. Okay. Because one of the, uh, the uh, most solid patterns statistically on the landing cases involve the fact that 97% uh, of the landing cases, it's like the object would find the most isolated farm the most isolated spot on that farm to land. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, certainly were not looking to be seen by anyone. Why, and, why do you uh, suppose I'm, that is, that they pick out of the way places where they would not be seen? Yeah, I think, I think they, whatever they're about, uh, they're not interested in talking to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, which disturbs me a lot about the abduction cases. Because so many of the landing events, uh, the farmer hears his dogs barking or the electrical power to the house goes out, which gets his attention. He steps out on the back steps and he sees a light way down in the woods. Mm -hmm. So he gets a shotgun, a flashlight, and he heads for the woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the greatest percentage of those events, uh, he'll see uh, a small guy, a couple of small guys uh, muddling around under the object, which is sitting on three or four legs, landing legs. And uh, in the opposite to the abduction things, they don't run out and grab this farmer and drag him on board and take him away. And I find that really interesting because it would be the perfect scenario. Mm -hmm. It's just the two little guys and the farmer and no one that even know yeah. what had happened. It just seems odd to me. But it, It's as if we landed on the moon and someone walked up and saw our craft. They're out there. They're gathering rocks. They're gathering samples. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's what you yeah, would expect exactly. someone from outer space to come here and do. They're, they're checking out our planet. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if they were not taking samples uh, or just plain looking around, uh, it appeared that they were working on the object. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know, repairs <laughs> or, or whatever. Yeah, maybe Trying to find an old Riley parts or something. I don't know. It's kind of a pit stop. Let's get out and check them. Check yeah. The, uh, open the hood and check everything out. How yeah, many... but they never, they never relieved themselves. I was always looking for anything. <laughs> so. Exactly. How many cases where there's physical evidence on the ground have you investigated where there was also the visual sighting of the occupants around it? Uh, in the, uh, the total cases, 
um, let's see, I've got to think right now, 19.1% of all the cases involved humanoids. Mm -hmm. And uh, well over 90% were little three-foot, three-and-a-half-foot guys. Mm -hmm. What are they described as? Are, is, are they consistently described the same way, or is it different kinds of extraterrestrials or whatever they are? Well, they, they, uh, uh, basically, they're, they're identical. Mm -hmm. uh, slightly enlarged heads, prominent eyes, thin spindly bodies, uh, kind of long, long fingers, and long, thin arms. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's just the, sort of the same thing over and over and over. And what I started finding really interesting was, uh, for example, you have a landing in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a good one in Iowa. I, I've always loved that case, daylight. Um, and the witness sees two little guys, mm -hmm. describes their clothing and what they look like and so on, and the object in the 20s. Then you see an almost identical object in guys in the 40s then in the 50s or 60s, then in the 80s. And I started thinking, well, wouldn't they at least change clothes once in a while? And then all of a sudden the light bulb came on. What if they're all leaving on the same day or the same week? Uh -huh. Or maybe they're leaving and then coming back and time has passed for us, but maybe for them it, it's still the same day. Exactly. You know, I more and more I've really considered the uh, possibilities of time manipulation, um, other dimensions. I at this point I'm a little confused mm -hmm. uh, because I see things that just shouldn't be, even in ufology. Right. And uh, uh, more and more I'm finding. Uh, I started seeing it with landing cases uh, years ago, but. I'm finding more and more now that there seems to be a connection between UFOs and what we call the paranormal. Okay. What, and, what is uh, the connection? Well, for example, uh, there was this case in Iowa where uh, uh, a lady and her two adult sons uh, live in this, this two-story home, an old home uh, out in the country, and it had been snowing. There was some ice on the ground, and one of the sons walks by an upstairs uh, window, and about 10, 15 feet from the window is a device, a machine, and through a sort of window or opening, he could see two figures inside, and uh, they were doing something to something in front of him which he couldn't see and so he yells at mom and brother and they thunder up to the second floor and all three stand there in daylight watching this thing suspended right outside their bedroom window and uh, uh, after quite a prolonged period of time the thing backs away a bit from the window and the guys are still visible and it goes vertically up and out of sight so they immediately run out into the yard where this over which this thing had been hovering and the ice was melted in a nice neat 10 foot circular pattern down to the uh, soil mm -hmm. and the soil had been dehydrated and uh, uh, just like you were zapped it was zapped with a microwave oven which is very very common mm -hmm. in traces and when they re-entered the house for the first time ever ever they uh, noticed dishes were flying across the kitchen and all kinds of poltergeist activity. And that continued in that house from that point on and had never been there before. And uh, uh, now I'm getting into uh, events in daylight where an invisible something, uh, for example, herds, uh, an entire herd of cattle into a corner of a field in a very, very tight packed herd and holds them there for 45 minutes while the owner's watching. And yet he could see nothing doing this. And the thing that I, I related to most people are much more familiar with is the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. Okay. Tell me about that. 
Well, that's uh, that's a ranch that Bob Bigelow bought a number of years ago, uh, following the uh, uh, some new owners bought this ranch and moved in, and uh, almost immediately they started having, believe me, <laughs> some pretty terrifying experiences. And uh, as an example, they saw a light of a lot of the uh, baseball sized light balls. Mm-hmm. And this is another feature of Marley Woods, and I've managed to see a lot of those. And uh, but some of the light balls, um, the blue ones and the red ones, seem to be uh, extremely dangerous. Uh, actually, a threat to animals, especially. And uh, so the uh, owner and his wife and adult son are standing out uh, outside talking one afternoon and one of the small blue objects comes in and uh, is kind of playing around with the uh, the dogs and they had three uh, adult labs and uh, so the dogs would get excited jump at the light ball it would come down it would go up and then it start moving away a little bit at a time and the dogs in this playful mood are following it and they uh, watch as uh, the light ball and the dogs go into a uh, clump of trees. And then they hear the dogs just yelping and screaming, quite obviously in a lot of pain, serious pain. Mm-hmm. And uh, the owner and his son run down there and the light ball is gone. And what they find uh, of the dogs are three kind of uh, greasy areas. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, and a lot of that sort of stuff goes on up there. And uh, and we're having similar stuff uh, at Marley. And it's often been, been said sometimes in, in the UFO community that, that the extraterrestrials are tricksters. So you think this is borne out from evidence like this? You know, I really think so. I talked uh, uh, with uh, Bob Bigelow and uh, Colm Kelleher. And uh, we discussed events from Marley and from Skinwalker. <clears throat> and one of the things that they, uh, they believe and they pointed out was it's like it's a sort of game. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and also, it, uh, and this is what I'm finding at Marley, uh, they do some really horrendous stuff, like to dogs or cattle, um, to kind of possibly to kind of uh, keep the the owner, uh, you know, they're saying, look at what we can do. Mm-hmm. And it seems to to keep the owner kind of at bay where he doesn't really try to interfere with whatever their their program is. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so, you know, you have to take all that into consideration. And they do play uh, they do play pranks. And uh, uh, Kelleher was telling me about some of the some of the pranks that have gone on, and so it was about <clears throat> five months later. Uh, I come home from Marley and uh, carry the car keys into the house, and this is very much like they were describing. And again, on the uh, kind of what would normally be a considered paranormal activity. Uh, and I carry the car he car keys in, I know, at least into the backyard. And the next time I'm ready to drive the car, I can't find the car keys. And I backtrack. I do everything. No car keys. I search everything. And every morning I take uh, uh, my dog down here to the office. And I uh, keep her lead and collar in this one drawer by the back door and I pull the drawer open, take it out, put it on her. We go down. And, uh, the fifth day I go in to get her lead, pull open the drawer and there are the keys on top of her lead. And, uh, uh, I've actually investigated a a haunted house in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And, uh, those folks went through that big time. I mean, some really incredible stuff. Mm-hmm. And I actually got to see some of it while I was there kind of investigating it. And uh, Okay, okay. What did you see? <laughs> well, 
the uh, I was taking uh, uh, digital images, uh, the areas where activity had happened, not to try to catch, you know, an orb or a dust speck or anything like that, but just to document where these events were taking place mm -hmm. in case there were changes uh, later. And things would move around. They would be displaced and appear somewhere else, uh, even some stuffed monkeys that they had. And uh, uh, so anyway, I'm standing there shooting these pictures, and the uh, owner is standing in front of me about eight feet away, and he said, Ted. And he had this really <laughs> bizarre look on his face, and I said, yeah, and he said, behind you. And I turned around, and they have this uh, terrifically heavy uh, chandelier. Uh -huh. And, uh, I mean, it's so heavy, it's, uh, it's got an iron pinning. And is almost on a log chain like uh, chain, and this thing was swinging very slowly, and it kept increasing in the swing. And uh, I flipped the camera around, put it on video, and got some really interesting video of this thing. And uh, the, all the doors and windows were closed, no air conditioning, no furnace on, nothing to make any kind of current. Uh, that would have moved this thing, but I'm telling you, you would it would take something heavy to make that chandelier move at all. And uh, uh, because he and I tried later, but um, pretty interesting stuff, you know. Do you and think because do you think because you're at the center of this um, study of UFOs and and the paranormal that mm -hmm. because you study it, maybe they're doing things specifically to you? Well, I haven't, I ha other than the car keys, I really haven't noticed uh, anything. Now, it's a bit frustrating because I'll have, for example, 10 CCD cameras running 24-7. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walk on uh, uh, the front porch of a cabin that uh, is kind of my office over there. And... Uh, walk up to the monitors and all of the cameras stop working okay. and uh and i get out there and i can't find anything any problem do everything i can do throw my hands up and say okay i'm going to be up all night tonight i'll go in and take a nap and uh, i come out still not working and six hours later suddenly they all just start working and i've had that happen numerous times mm -hmm. And uh, there's there's just no explanation for it. And I've had actually uh, I've had a whole bank of uh, uh, digital still cameras and video cameras and also the property owners cameras just all stop instantly at the same time. Uh, cell phones stop. Um, one instance, uh, a couple had arrived over there in a brand new uh, Cadillac, one of their neighbors. And uh, the husband stayed in the car and uh, he has a hard time getting it out of the car. So he just sat in the car and uh, some of the Ambers, I think it was seven of the Ambers came pretty close and were just stationary. And all of a sudden the uh, uh, electronic locks on that caddy started opening, closing, locking, unlocking. The radio came on and started running the frequencies, and the alarm system on the car was going off, on, off, on. And uh, when the things disappeared back into themselves or whatever, uh, all that just stopped. So they're and creating some sort of electromagnetic disturbance when they're doing this. Absolutely they are, yeah. Okay. And that's one of the things that uh, we found really early on in the uh, trace landing events um, is that the soil and the plants wouldn't be burned, charred, anything like that, or even smashed. They were dehydrated. All the moisture sapped out, wilted and dead almost instantly. And uh, just like you'd toss them in a microwave oven. And uh, uh, along with the EM effects that you find on automobile engines, and uh, I've got a catalog of about 800 cases where automobile engines have been affected uh, as an object was close to the automobile. Mm -hmm. 
And um, at Marley, we had a case where a large white object uh, was hovering and it dropped a beam to the ground and it was about 600 feet from the farmhouse. And uh, uh, when the uh, owners, after the thing uh, got a little closer and the beam moved with it, lighting up the ground, they looked into the uh, upstairs <clears throat> from their deck and they saw Christmas tree lights illuminated. And uh, all of the uh, light strings in the upstairs. And when the object uh, uh, finally left, it went straight up, disappeared. They went in to check the Christmas lights and they weren't plugged in. So that's a pretty good EM pulse to do that. Do you think that these things, whatever they are, devices, UFOs, are um, physical when they appear? Or do you think that uh, maybe they're, they're non-physical? Well, I think, I think for sure uh, the, the old classic saucer types um, definitely were, are physical, at least at certain points in time. Uh, because when I go to a landing site, for example, if the object had three legs or four, you'd have the landing pad imprints in the ground. And uh, you could do uh, compaction tests on those imprints and determine uh, pretty closely the weight of the object. And uh, always it would be, depending on the type of object, between 7 and 14 tons. So you're talking about a massive object. And, uh, and obviously quite physical to put these indentations uh, deeply into the ground and give you that kind of uh, compaction. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think, and they do a lot of damage to tree limbs or even trees if they come down into a very uh, tight area. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they're definitely physical at some points. But uh, I'm beginning to think, um, and I'll tell you, I think Alan Hynek would be uh, one of the first people that would start seeing this himself and not be too surprised that there are points when some of the objects become, as far as uh, the way we think about physical, they become not physical. Okay. And uh, so there, you have to be really careful when you say, well, there's uh, an involvement with paranormal activity they generated or whatever. Uh, if you're talking about um, paranormal activities such as ghosts or spirits or anything like that, um, I think we're looking at, at a technology that is tremendously advanced mm -hmm. and uh, obviously. You know, because they had these things going uh, back in the 20s, and Jacques has found some excellent cases way, way beyond that. Mm -hmm. So you don't think that these uh, are ghosts that are appearing no. as aliens? They're aliens that are, are some occupants of the UFOs that are doing something that manifests itself as poltergeist or ghost-type activity. Well, yeah. Yeah, and that may be simply, it may be a product of their being, or it may be simply uh, an effort to confuse the issue as far as anyone trying to understand it. Um, but you have to remember, um, today, uh, they can make an army tank invisible in broad daylight, mm -hmm. and simply by bending light, uh, that has been displayed uh, a number of times. And so uh, uh, I have to go back to uh, Jacques and his books because this guy was has always been a really far thinker. And I think he was more on the path than we were uh, because we lean because of the physical aspect a little more to, uh, well, these are, are beings coming here. They're building ships and coming here from somewhere else. And uh, Jacques was always kind of beyond that. And uh, his book, Messengers of Deception, um, I, you know, he, and he wrote that back, I think, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I now tend to bend that way, I think, more than I do uh, extraterrestrials. 
When you're investigating a, uh, a landing area, what type of things do you find in that area? Have you ever seen something where they left something behind? Maybe that came off the craft. That uh, you no, thought it was. no, I have not. Uh, I've had, uh, uh, for example, I was coming back from Florida with uh, Jim Lorenzen, who was the director of the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization back in the uh, 60s and so on. And as we're uh, visiting, uh, he said, uh, I want to show you something. And he takes uh, out of a little box a piece of what looked like a metal of some kind, but it was so thin, it was uh, as thin as a piece of cellophane. And he would do this business, which you hear about Roswell all the time, of crumpling it up in a ball, turning it loose, and it would just flatten out without a wrinkle. And he said, hold your hand out. And he had uh, this stuff about, oh, six or eight inches above my hand, dropped it, and you couldn't feel it. It absolutely was that light. You could not feel it hit your skin. And so... Where did it come he was, from? Uh, from a landing, supposedly, in, uh, I believe it was Finland. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, flying from Florida to uh, uh, Washington, D.C. <laughs> to turn it over to uh, a government lab. And, uh, of course, that was the end of that piece of whatever right. it was. And this was well before anyone knew anything about Roswell and the story behind it of this type of material. Yeah, this was uh, this was in '69, I believe. And you handled this yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What yeah. other th What other things have you um, have you discovered about spe specifically about landing uh, areas that make that area different from the surrounding areas? Well, what you find there are three primary types of uh, of evidence, and that is. Uh, the area is either depressed, uh, burnt, or dehydrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, uh, burnt areas and the depressed areas are about equal in uh, quantity. And, uh, but the, de the dehydrated areas are much, much more interesting as far as laboratory analysis and what you might be able to find. But in the depressed areas, you generally will have... Uh, a circular area where it's kind of like a donut. The central area, the uh, alfalfa, the tall grass, whatever is there, is standing normally, and there will be a foot to a foot and a half wide ring mm -hmm. where the uh, plants are not only depressed, but swirled in a very, very tight pattern. And uh, uh, it's pretty fascinating stuff. And we just uh, had three new ones at Marley uh, about three weeks ago. And they were all identical size and configuration and so on. And uh, typically, uh, you don't find any kind of measurable traces in uh, the depressed sites. Uh, we did have one there uh, that was an oval site in last uh, July. And it had, at the north end of the oval, a circular two-foot area that was uh, pretty highly radioactive. And uh, that's not normal. Uh, very few of the, of the sites have radioactivity. And uh, the burn sites typically will not be circular. They'll be irregular. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as though, as the object was coming in or going out, uh, it spread the effect rather than having that symmetrical pattern. And the dehydrated sites, uh, the majority of those are circular and about 8 to 10 feet in diameter. You know, we, we've had a lot of triangle UFO sightings, triangular shaped mm -hmm. craft. Have you ever found a triangular pattern on the ground? Uh, I did. Um, and <laughs> it it was back in those days, you didn't really think, you know, there were not very many sightings of a triangular object. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1975. And uh, there was a landing uh, here in Missouri. And uh, uh, the rancher uh, saw the object on there and he had three 
uh, extremely serious, big security dogs. And he turns them off their leads and told them to go. And they ran about 20 feet, stopped, and crawled on their bellies backwards. And he said, when that happened, I decided to go in the house and, and wait till morning to go down there. And, uh, but he found uh, uh, a dehydrated cedar tree about 15 feet from uh, the site. The uh, site actually was an oval dehydrated, very dehydrated area. And there were three imprints, small, very unusual imprints, in a, uh, a very elongated triangular pattern. And um, now what's interesting for the first time ever in Marley in January of this year, we had uh, a guy and his wife uh, report a triangular shaped object device about three feet above the ground. And it was about uh, four feet long uh, and a uh, equilateral triangle. And they could see it had a uh, uh, kind of between a metallic and a almost plastic looking skin on the, on the uh, structure. And uh, it was silent and no uh, illumination. They walked up on it because their dog was out there going crazy. And uh, he had a, uh, a pretty powerful flashlight and uh, shined it on it. And it stayed there for, oh, 15, 20 seconds and then silently went vertical and disappeared. And it had no light on it at all. So uh, that's another new uh, thing. And what's great about this stuff, when you think you've pretty well seen it all, mm -hmm. something new and even better or weirder comes along, believe me. Well, you know, you have so, all of this, this physical evidence over, what, almost 4,000 cases of landings. Why yeah. hasn't the scientific community taken a serious look at this? Well, that's that's a really good question. And, uh, you know, Alan Hynek was a, uh, a highly respected and well-known and distinguished scientist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he chose his words very carefully because he had to. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I tried for uh, quite a long while. We were best of friends for about 18 years until he passed on. And um, we were able to get only one research grant for 4000 bucks, And that was back in uh, 1974. We made good use of it. But, um, and we did presentations to the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And we had meetings with the uh, AIAA. UFO subcommittee with Peter Sturrock, chairman, and uh, they talked seriously about it. They were seriously interested, but you take them out of those closed rooms and they don't know anything. All right. You know, and it's a peer thing, totally, uh, because they want to keep getting research grants and uh, they don't want, you know, to have people thinking they should be in a psychiatric ward. And that's the unfor unfortunate thing, uh, because, and the media has played a big part in this, the government a lot, but also the media. I've watched them, uh, how they handled this unknown yet missile or whatever it was uh, out in the ocean off of uh, L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, here you have video, very clearly shows it, and the object at the head of the contrail looks a little odd, but uh, the media all day long has been this tongue in cheek, you know, um, uh, is it a flying saucer, you know, and they chuckle right. and, and have a lot of fun with it. So why would any witness report a sighting at all? Right. Because they know clearly what's going to happen. And, uh, so many of the documentaries that, uh, you have on TV, um, You'll see the Iowa farm family, the guy's wife and 15 kids, and they, they give them 30 seconds to say, yeah, it was right up there. It did this. Okay, well, that sounds really weird. Thank you. And then they bring on, after a commercial, uh, a psychologist or a skeptic to uh, discredit the farm family. You know, right. so 
Exactly. Uh, the only way I get all these cases at Marley is I almost live there and everyone knows me. And the one thing they asked me when they invited me down was to please never uh, make public the location or any of the witnesses' names. Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely. And I've held to that and they know that. And uh, so when something happens, I get a call sometimes while it's even going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to develop that rapport. Uh, you have to let people know that uh, it's not going to go to the media. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you and I can talk about the cases all we want mm -hmm. uh, as long, you know, as I stay away from the stuff I can't talk about. The uh, videos that you've shot there, is there anything that you've released uh, not yet. I, uh, as a matter of fact, um, having a, a really nice website built, mm -hmm. a gentleman offered to do it for me and, uh, that's really his thing and, uh, it'll be a nice one. And, uh, I have been so busy, uh, at Marley and a couple of other projects. Um, one of them in Slovakia, that's one that really takes a lot of time to have to go over there, but, um, uh, uh, I'm dragging my feet on, uh, uh, getting the material to be posted to him and, and so on. But, um, I will have some video clips and, uh, guys, I've got now hours of video and some of it is, uh, is really crummy. Uh, but it shows something is there that shouldn't be there and is, terrifically unusual and uh, uh, it's only crummy because uh, the farmer sees some of these things and for the first time in his entire life he goes into Walmart and he buys a video recorder mm -hmm. and uh, goes out and he really doesn't know how to run it and I have the, the biggest problem convincing people they need to put it on a tripod right and it's like they've got to hold it in their hands, and you know what that results in. Yeah. But uh, but nevertheless, it's it's evidence. And uh, but the CCD cameras, uh, of course, are all sturdily mounted. And when something happens, uh, I just uh, obtained uh, last week. Um, what is it? About eleven minutes of video of an object uh, on the ground through trees, beams of light coming out of it vertically, and then it comes out of the trees and uh, makes its way higher in the sky before it just uh, zaps out. And it's uh, that odd amber color, circular in shape, and uh, I hope to put that on the website uh, when we get it going. When you get video like this, is it is it night vision or is it color uh, clear in color video? Well, I try to keep it clear in color. Uh, the uh, CCD cameras, uh, most of them are uh, color and some night vision. And the objects, what I've found is they're bright enough, generally, uh, that you can shoot them with uh, just about any kind of even cheesy video camera uh, without night vision, which, of course, is, uh, is the best if you can do it. And... <clears throat> the best thing I found, I uh, had a chance to get my hands on a little uh, Kodak PlaySport video camera. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is really a pocket-sized job. And all you've got to do is pop the, the power, pop the uh, uh, on button, and it's recording. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to worry about uh, the thing searching uh, back and forth, going in and out of focus. It's always in focus mm -hmm. uh, at infinity. And uh, it, I mean, it picks up, uh, well, the planet Jupiter. And uh, these objects, by and large, are way, way brighter uh, than Venus or anything you see in the sky short of the moon. And uh, so it works really well, and the color is great. You know, it. And, and Marley Woods is, there's actually, this place is not actually called Marley Woods, right? Is oh, that, no. Uh -uh. That's no, just a name no. made up. Yeah, I went <laughs> I went on Google Earth, and uh, I searched everywhere for 
a couple hundred miles uh-huh. around this location to be sure there was nothing there called the woods uh-huh. or something woods or Marley or anything like that. And I don't know. I was just thinking of Marley for some reason. And I thought, well, Marley Woods, that sounds good. And so you, you can't <laughs> tell us what state it's in either. No, I really can't. Yeah. I really can't. Well, I understand. I, would, I tell you, I honestly, so many times I've tried to tell an audience or, or whatever, uh, I wish I didn't have to jump through hoops talking about some of this stuff. Uh, but that's even true of some of the uh, uh, really uh, high strangeness landing cases from even years back. Um, you know, once... You tell people, witnesses, that you're not going to do it. You just, you, I can't do it. So, mm-hmm. and, and if you ever give that location out, you're going to have hoaxers show up making lights, putting balloons in the air, things like that, that would interfere with your research. Oh, well, absolutely. And not only that, the uh, these ranches are uh, uh, secured. And uh, they have caretakers who have guns. And uh, without any question, if anybody tried to go over a fence or a gate uh, and not stop when they told them to, uh, they'd be in big trouble. Right. And uh, they, uh, they wouldn't hesitate to do it because they have a lot of very valuable cattle uh, along with machinery and, you know, um, a lot of stuff there that uh, you wouldn't want, for example, 10,000 people busting down fences to get in and see the lights and so on. Right. Uh, and I ran into that up in uh, Langenberg, Saskatchewan. Uh, Edwin Fuhr saw five metallic objects uh, uh, down in the tops of some four or five foot tall grass in daylight one Sunday morning. And uh, they were uh, uh, dome shaped. And they were rotating very quickly. He was, he walked up within 15 feet of the lead object and uh, uh, pretty quickly backed up and got back on his, what we would call a combine, Mm -hmm. and uh, could then see the five objects and the grass moving under, underneath each, and they were spinning rapidly. And uh, out of one of the objects, he sees two long sort of pipes or rods that come out in a uh, V configuration and they're both moving around the horizontal axis and the grass is moving uh, where they're moving. And uh, suddenly they take off with no sound in a step formation and go straight up. And it was a cloudy, drizzly morning and uh, cloud ceiling was 3000 feet. They stopped just under the clouds and formed a straight line there was a terrific gust of wind or something that came out of two pipe-like extensions on the base of each of the objects, and they disappeared into the clouds. And he waited five minutes to be sure they weren't coming back, got off the uh, combine and walked back up, and he found five rings where these objects had been and the V configuration where the, uh, the tall grass was beat down by these two rods. And in each of the rings, the central area uh, was standing normally. And so my theory on that has always been, and I have it with a number of those types of sightings, where they're swirled and packed down tightly, is a device like that with two openings at the base, which can eject a uh, a powerful blast of something. Mm -hmm. If they're sitting there in the grass, spinning, not on the ground, uh, you're going to get that packed down clockwise uh, right. situation, and uh, but that was, I mean that that was an excellent case. But by the time wow. Alan found out about it, call me, had me go up there. There had been uh, the RCMP estimated about eight thousand people wow. through there, and the rings were no more. But uh, luckily, the RCMPs did a magnificent job investigating the case and photographing the area in the rings and everything before the herd got there. So, you know, uh, I can't imagine anybody that would want to advertise something like that had happened. Exactly. Ted, I've got time for one more question. 
do okay. you think that there will be some sort of disclosure that will ever have a uh, a solution to this mystery? You know, I think the only way that that might happen uh, would be if a group of scientists seriously looked at uh, at this stuff. And uh, my hopes uh, in that respect would be with a guy like Michio Kaku, because uh, I understand he has some interest in UFOs, mm -hmm. and he's made the statement, you know, why not? Exactly. Uh, and uh, this guy has, I think, such stature, and he chooses his words carefully, too, which he has to. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, other than if there is a, a disclosure on the part of whatever this is, right. I don't think the government will ever try to back out of it. Uh, they've really painted themselves in a corner, and uh, I can't imagine any president going on a, a, a global news uh, conference and saying our past presidents and Congress has been lying to the American public for 60 years, 70 years. Exactly. You know, I just, I can't see that. Ted, thank you so much for being my guest on Conundrums. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay. And uh, we'll have another program next week. Stay tuned and be sure to bookmark the site and uh, we'll have Ted back again. <laughs>